What is up everyone, my name is Aish Grenade and welcome to lesson 2 of the GSC tutorial. In this tutorial we will be moving an object and spinning an object and just showing you a little bit more about messing around with entities in Radium. Let's go check this out, look at that. There we go, it's moving around and it's going to stop when it gets to there. Boom. Movement complete. So that is just what we wanted to see. I'm going to show you exactly how we did that and also what we're going to do is set it up so that it loops as well. You know, this platform doesn't want to stop. What are we going to do? We're going to stand on this beach because we are outsmarting these zombies right now on this magical moving platform. Oh God. Oh God. They're getting to me. They can still see me though. The height of it is slightly too big. If you made it slightly smaller, so sort of the size of a step, then the zombies would be able to climb onto it. So let's go to your maps GSC and we will have a look at this. To get to your maps GSC, the best way for you probably is to go to the launcher unless you have it open already. Right click on the map that you're working on and go to open map folder. Then you're gonna wanna click on the scripts folder zm and go and open the gsc i've got it open here might look a bit daunting but don't worry we'll go through this so in the last gsc scripting lesson one we created this credit script along with the apple script today we're going to be creating the moving object using a loop so to start off let's thread this new function so we're going to create one called thread uh, what should we call it moving object and there we go so we've threaded this new function but now we need to write it so once again we'll just go down a bit to the end of the file and we're going to type function moving object you can see that the intelligence has picked up the function name already because we've declared it above so you can just hit enter and then don't forget to add the two parentheses and after that if you hit enter and then type in the first script tag it should complete the other one for you and then hit enter again and it'll put it on the right line so from here we're going to need to do a few things but before we go any further let's open up radiant because this will involve creating objects in radiant as well so i've just opened it by right clicking and clicking on open in radiant and now the map is loading there we go okay so just for the sake of this tutorial i'm going to be creating something very simple and we're just going to be moving it around so if we go in the grid view and we look down i'm just going to create one that is sort of this sort of size and that should be fine and then what i'm going to do i'm just going to give it a texture so it's not some weird broken texture what texture should we use i guess we can use some sort of stone or something like that that would be interesting okay there we go so we've got a stone platform the next thing we're going to need to do is if you are scripting any brushes or patches or models you're going to need to make them into a script entity and there are different script entities for whatever you're using so if you want to script a model you got to use a script model entity if you're scripting a brush or a patch then you want to script it then you want to set it up as a script brush model so if you press B on the keyboard, alternatively, you can right click at the top and go to Entity Browser. Uh, and then we're gonna go to where it says Script and just open up this column. And you'll see here we have these different options. The only two that you will need to think about at the moment is these two here. Model is for models, brush model is for brushes and patches. So we have a brush here selected. I just hit J to hide and show the lines so you can see that it's selected better. You might also have Shift J to show it tinted. That's another way of showing it selected. The next thing is what we're going to do is you can either double click on brush model, make sure you have it selected, or you can drag brush model onto the object and let go. And that's another way of applying it. So we've just created this into brush model and you can confirm it by looking in the grid view and seeing that it says script brush model. The other way to confirm it is if you press N or right click at the top, and go to the entity info and then if we drag this out so we can see a bit better you'll see at the top here it says script brush model if you don't see script brush model when you press n and it literally just says world spawn so look, if i select the floor and we press n it says world spawn it means that it's not a script brush model or vice versa script model the same goes for brushes as models we're just going to be working with a brush at the moment and there's a few properties here that we want to work with so i drag this out so you can see one of the things i would say is if it's going to be an object that moves so where it is at the moment when the map's generated it's going to create a navigational mesh a nav mesh for the zombies to walk around and because we started off here what's going to happen is there's going to be a square here where zombies won't want to path correctly and because we're going to be moving this around we want to set the dynamic path kvp to true and setting this to true will just mean that the nav mesh stays updated and the zombies will basically be able to path on this wherever it may be so the next thing i'm going to do is we're going to go here to where it says moving 
platform enabled. This is another KVP that will help zombies path correctly. If you find that they can't see you when you're on a moving object and they seem to just stand still and not know where you are, even if it's pathed right, it can help to set it up as a moving platform enabled. You want to set this to true so that you're telling the program, okay, well, this platform moves and we want the zombies to get onto it, okay? When you have things that you can reach, players will be interacting with, aka standing on or moving around on, then nine times out of 10, you're gonna to wanna to set this moving platform enabled to true. Not always though, it's good reason to not need this and not need the dynamic path as well, is when you have objects that are out of player's reach or the players don't really interact with, like a ceiling fan, or maybe you could even script some clock hands or anything really that moves, but players won't be standing on or walking across or anything that won't interfere with the navigational mesh. So these KVPs here are just important for this tutorial because because we're gonna be having this platform move around. Okay, so the next thing is, we're just gonna make this platform go from here to here, to here, to here, and then back to here. The best way to know about what sort of values we're gonna to need to assign to get it to move, we need to look down here where we have these statistics here. And, and more importantly here, this shows the transition of movement. So if you click here and you hold down click and you drag, if we drag it down to here, it's gonna tell you all the numbers that you need to know to script. So it tells you that it's moved no nowhere on the x-axis, it's moved nowhere on the z-axis, but it's moved negative 120 28 on the y axis so you know that the first value is going to be negative y 128 the next value is going to be positive x 128 then it's going to be positive y 128 and then it's going to be negative x 128 which will bring it back to square one so we're just going to start off with this and then we'll go a bit more complex so there is one last thing we need to do just before we hop in and start writing some code is we need to give this a unique identifier and the correct name for a unique identifier in terms of Call of Duty's mod tools is called a target name and that is just what they call IDs so a target name you can give is the same in HTML as a class and also an ID in the sense that you can give everything the same ID name and have it in an array but if you have more than one thing with the same ID then it considers itself as a class then you need to start using arrays to, to get that to work. If we're just going to give this something simple, we're going to call this the platform. It helps to give it a very descriptive name so that when you're scripting, it makes more sense to you. So if we just call this OBJ1, then you're going to get confused if you have loads of different objects around your map that do different things. So if you be a bit more descriptive, like and call it platform, then when it comes to scripting, it's going to make more sense because it'll be much more readable and you're going to understand what's going on. So let's go into the script now. We're given that platform and we're gonna save this. So make sure that little star disappears. There we go. And now we're gonna jump into Sublime and write this script. The number one thing you need to do before you interact with any entities is to make sure that they are set up as a variable. As of right now, if we try to do something with platform, for example, with this platform, if we try to delete it, it won't work. It's gonna throw an error at us and say this variable is not declared, is not identified, it's not recognized, it doesn't exist yet because we haven't set it up as a variable yet. This goes back to lesson one, setting up variables. The first thing we need to do whenever we interact with an object is work out A, is it already a variable? B, can it be reached in this function? If we set up a variable in a different function, then it can only be used in that function. There are ways of getting it out of the function, and one of the ways is uh, using a level, which means it will be global. Before we get into level variables, I think the first thing we should do is just make this variable for the platform. So because this moving object only needs to be altered with in this function, we can create the platform variable in this function. That's one important thing to know is that variables, yeah, they won't be shared around functions unless you pass them around using parameters or if you pass them around using global variable. We're gonna create this and we, we're gonna call it platform. And then we need to say that the variable is equal to, so now we're gonna assign it the actual entity. So we need to go and get the entity. So we're gonna use the get ent function, which takes two parameters. The first parameter it needs is the ID we gave it, AKA the target name. We gave it the target name of platform. If we go and have a look in Radiant quick, this is what we're saying. Okay, well the target name is platform. Then the next thing we need to give it is going to be target name because that is what we've just given it. Theoretically could say that it could be any sort of 
any one of these kvps and then we're going to get any of the entities within the game to explain why we have to tell it that this is the target name you can actually use the get ent function to get all sorts of things so we go back to radiant and we see here that we're using the target name to declare it you could also use another thing we could create a script string and if we call it hello then when we go and code we could say okay well we want to get the entity with a script string of hello and now it's going to make sure that it gets that entity and assigns it to platform there are different ways that you can get an entity you could say oh, okay i want all the entities that have the color setting to green and then you give the, the code that's used for the green or there's loads of different ways you can get entities but by default the most used way the most times you'll come across it is by getting the target name which in this case is that platform so now that we've assigned the entity itself to the variable platform here we can start doing some cool stuff to the variable which will then change the entity itself in the game so here we go we want to first of all let's just say that we don't want it to do anything until you're loaded in game so we're just going to do copy and paste so now we've just placed in this flag here so that this moving object function doesn't start working until the initial black screen has passed after the black screen has passed the platform is assigned to the variable and and then we just want it to start moving around so there are loads of different functions that you can use and i urge you to go to your black ops 3 route to your doc mod tools and to have a look and always use this black ops 3 script api functions document okay so this file has just opened and the best way of going around this file is pressing Control f and then running a string search on the page we're going to be working with the move x and the move y function it's also move to there's all sorts of other manipulating and object functions we can use but in this case we're just going to use that move x and move y so we've just typed in move x and here it tells you you're going to want to either use one of these a script model a script origin or a script brush model so that's checked straight away we have a script brush model so that's all good and we're going to want to give it that variable name so the next thing is okay well this is the name of the function move x it's highlighted in pink because we've searched for it we could close the search and it would stop highlighting it and then it tells us that there are are four parameters that it can take so the first one is the point it explains a bit further down here about what these different parameters are and it also tells you whether they're mandatory or optional you don't necessarily need the optional ones but it might help script it and make it look like and work in the way that you want it for the sake of this tutorial we're not going to be using these optional parameters but you may want to play around with them later on here it shows the example here train move x so and so so and so and there's a train entity that they would have set up and it's using move x and then in parentheses we set the four parameters so we're just going to use something just like this to move our entity and we'll see here that the first one is the amount of the x value that it wants to move the entity to as a floating point number don't worry too much about what a floating point number is it's just a data type for a number that may or may not have a decimal value but at the moment you don't need to worry about that too much the next thing is the time the amount of time it takes to go from the source to the destination and we're going to be probably setting that as about two seconds now that we know that this function exists if you don't know if something exists you can just do control f and look for something that might be what you want say i want to change the color or something maybe here you go object set color so i've never seen this before but i just typed in color just then and it looks like you can set the color name for something i don't know you can try all these different things and it gives you a bit of a breakdown and shows you how it works but yeah this api script resource is something that you want to come to and just try different things nine times out of ten you'll find something that you're looking for quickly using a search function the last thing just before we go into the code is if we scroll down you'll see that there is also the move y and the move z these are just the exact same as the move x except they just work on the different axes so whatever value enter into here it will just move on the y or the x there is another one here which is move 2 which is a bit more advanced because it takes in all of the x y and z values as as one but it essentially is exactly the same so this one will help you when you're trying to make it move at any sort of angle really or from any place to any place whether it's a straight grid like movement or not the move two will help in that situation but this one you need to set up as the origin and the origin if we go over here back to radiant takes three values so when you set up the move two you're gonna need to give it three values and because there are three values you need to encase it in brackets but we won't be using move two in this tutorial we're just going to be moving with the move x 
So we've got the platform here and we're gonna move it with move X. So we're gonna do platform and we want it to move X. And if we remember back to earlier when we were in Radiant, it actually was the Y axis that would move first. So we're gonna use the move Y and then we want it to move minus 128. And we want it to take, let's just say two seconds to do so. So it's done that and after that we want it to move to the right. So what we can do is we can do copy and paste and then just set it to X and we want it to move 128 to the right and then we want to do move Y but we want that positive and we want that negative so that it moves Y down and then it moves X so it's going to move 128 across and then it's going to move Y up and then it's going to move X back so it'll be back to the original point. The problem with leaving it like this is it's gonna see this and then it's gonna see this and then it's gonna see this and it's gonna see this. And effectively, they're all gonna cancel each other out. If it's moving that way and that way at the same time, it's not gonna it's not gonna move anywhere. If it's moving that way and that way at the same time, it's not gonna move anywhere. You know, this parameter just says how long it takes. It's not gonna stay on this action for two seconds, but it will take two seconds. So it's just gonna go ding, ding, ding straight away and get to the bottom. What we wanna do is have a weight in between them. And you wanna have that to whatever value you set it at if you want it to take that long. So if we do weight two and we do weight two here, this function is incredibly important. You're gonna be using the weight function all the time. And yeah, there we go. So we're gonna say weight two. And so we're just gonna write a little thing at the end that says movement complete. It's good to write loads of little system messages to yourself just so you know how things are working out. You know, we could write one at the top that says movement started. And when you write these little things and say that it doesn't move because you scripted it wrong in some way, but you said it moves here and then at some point it says it completes and you see it doesn't move, then you know that it is running through the function and that it's a problem with what you wrote in the middle. If you didn't write these and you didn't see it move, then you don't really necessarily know even if this function works works if it broke somewhere else so it's always good to have these little comments or these in-game comments so that it gives you some visual feedback of how it's working so we're going to save this and then the next thing which is important is to use the link and we're also going to need to compile it because we created that script entity or that script brush model as well so i'm going to compile this and then we'll go check it out in game look at that there we go it's moving around and it's going to stop when it gets to there boom Movement complete. Okay, well that was pretty cool, but you saw that it stopped and maybe you just want it to keep going round and round and round. You could just copy and paste this and paste it a billion times or however many times you want it, but that would be an insanely bad use of the scripting. You don't want to do that. And to stop people having to write things over and over again or to make things go like an unlimited amount of time, we need to use loops. There are loads of different loops and we're just going to go through one of the main ones that you're going to be using in your scripting which is a while loop so we're going to use like a forever loop that you can set up a while loop to run until something happens that will stop it happening but in this case we're just going to keep it running forever so to make a loop run forever well there are loads of different loops there's while loops for loops and there's also a for each loop, which is a way of looping through an array. So let's use this while loop. So we're gonna type in while, and then we need to give it a parameter. So this parameter is, okay, well, this is, it's gonna keep running while this is true, basically. And you could just set it to, okay, while true, which means while, you know, true is true. What's one equal to? One is equal to one. If you said while one is equal to two, this will never run because one is not equal to two. If you said this while one is equal to one, then this will run forever because one is always equal to one. Even shorter version of this is while one, because in computer language that is like while yes, you haven't said no to it, so it's not gonna stop running. So we're just gonna say while one, there are loads of other ways of doing this. Some people might recognize seeing a four and then semicolon, semicolon, which is the same thing as a while one, but we're just gonna run it with a while one because that makes most sense to me. The next thing is we're gonna have some script brackets for this and we're just gonna take what we wrote here and cut that and paste it in here. So I'm just gonna select all of this and press tab and it's gonna indent it for us. And there we go, we got it there. So while one, this is gonna run and the movement complete will actually, I don't think that will ever come because it will never say it's completed. You know, this while will just keep going. We could make it count a certain number of times 
user can make it count to 100 and then when it's finished 100 it'll break the loop and then it will say movement complete but it should never say movement complete because we're making this run forever the next thing i will explain is if you're ever making an infinite loop like we're making now you always want to have a weight somewhere say you want it to move a thousand something and take like 200 seconds and that's all you want it to do you know that will just keep moving and moving because it's going to do that and it's going to do that the problem without having a weight like any weight at all is going to overload the system the system's going to just go crazy because every time it meets this function it will finish come back around and then it will meet it again like almost instantaneously so you can, it will crash and it will cause a bug because you've created a loop that just overloads the system. So in any infinite loop, you're going to want to have either one of two things, really. Nine times out of ten, it's just easier to write weight 0.05. That's the minimum you can have. That's a minimum unit of time for a weight value. Yeah, so you can just write weight one. That's going to all that act like it happens instantaneously because of how, how little time that is. But yeah, you need that in an infinite loop. Yeah, in our case, we're actually using like these weights already so it's not going to overload the system but i thought i'd just say that before anyone comes across that problem okay so we're going to save this here and we're going to go in radium so i just thought we would make another one while it's compiling so i can show you some different things that you can do uh, if we take this entity that we made and we'll just move over here and paste it over here so we've got a copy of it and what we're going to do is we're going to just change this one to spinner and we're going to make this one rotate instead so instead of it moving around we're going to make it spin so we're going to rotate this other object that we made and there are loads of different rotation functions we can use we've got the rotation and rotation vector we got rotate pitch we got rotate roll we got rotate two rotate velocity rotate your the simple ones are rotate pitch rotate your and rotate your these are just rotations that happen on different axes for this tutorial we're just going to be messing with the rotate yaw if we just go and type in rotate yaw we will find that it wants an angle and it wants the time that it takes to rotate in seconds so this is how much it moves in degrees from its original setting as you know degrees goes from 0 to 360 aka the same thing and you can put in any value you want yeah we're just gonna use this rotate your and and put in a value 360 so if we go to the code we're gonna need to set up a variable for the new object that we got and i'm just gonna call it spinner and we gave it the target name of spinner and then we want to do okay well we want it to spin once before we want anything else to happen okay so because code executes from top down and we got an infinite loop here we don't want to put it underneath this because it will never spin so if we put it above we could put it in its own function and then they could be working together but for the sake of this tutorial we're just going to create it so that it spins before so what are we going to do if we press enter enter and we just give us some space okay then we're going to say we want the spinner to rotate on and then you'll see it gives us all these different ones that we can work with we're just going to make it work with rotate your you can also play around with roll pitch and two and also rotate and look in the api scripting and see how it's used if you don't know how it's used then you might want to just go through some other script files in the share raw scripts and just see how Treyarch have used it you could probably run a string search I'll probably explain this later on. Anyway, so we're going to be using rotate your. And then if we go back to the API, we'll see that it wants these two mandatory parameters. It wants the your angle and then the time it takes. So let's go back to the script and it wants a new angle. So this is going to take whatever it is and then add or minus, depending on whether you put a minus or, or a positive value in there. Okay, so we want it to spin 360 degrees. So we're going to type in 360. Then we want to press comma and type in the next value, which in this case is how long it takes to spin 360 degrees. So one, two, three. The best way of thinking about how long something takes is to literally, okay, if you, <laughs> this is going to seem stupid. If we're looking on the table, if we're looking on the table and you just put your finger down and you count, okay, so we want it to spin around like this. If you count in your head how long that takes and then use that as a value. So one, two, three, four. That took four seconds. Okay, so with that silly little example, <laughs> we know that we want it to take four seconds to spin a full 360 degrees. So we're gonna type in four there. 
then we need to make sure we finish it with a semicolon. So what we've done is we set up this spinner variable and then we've made it spin a full 360 degrees which takes four seconds and then after it's done that it will start the movement of the platform so move platform we're going to just change this to platform so that we know it's talking about the platform and then we're going to put this at the end not that this will ever show because it's an infinite loop right the next thing is we probably want to put a weight between this and the platform so we're going to put a two second wait there so that it doesn't instantaneously go from the spin. It stops, waits two seconds, then the platform starts moving. Don't even need a wait, it's just to show you wait, that you can have different weights in here. You can even have decimal values, you know, like a 1.5. We save that and what we're going to do is we're going to compile this and go check it out. Because we added in a new object in Radiant, we need to have that compile option set. If you haven't added in anything new or changed anything in Radiant, then you only need to link because the link is where it compiles the scripting. So we have done both. So we need to have the compile checked and the link checked. And then I've also got run checked so that it runs the game straight after. So here we go guys, it is loading and we're going to see that the new object there starts spinning. And what is this? This platform is moving before it's finished. Why is it doing that? Let's quickly just go have a look in the code and you'll see exactly why that's happened. So we go in the code here and you'll see that we set up this spinning platform and we wanted it to spin 360 degrees and take four seconds. And then we want it to wait one and a half seconds before it starts moving the platform. For some reason, it started moving before it finished spinning. That is because, and for the same reason, we have got these weights in between these platform movements. Because the code, when it sees a, a moving function or a rotating function, it doesn't wait on this function for four seconds. As soon as it sees this, it sees it and executes it. And then straight away, it goes to the next line. If it didn't have this weight, for example, and then it will start moving the other one. And because these are all, they would all cancel each other out, it would look like the platform didn't move. So we've added in these weights and if we go back up here and we see that this is rotate your and it takes four seconds well it goes straight to the next function which is wait one and a half seconds so it's actually going to start two and a half seconds early so if we change this to 5.5 then what it's going to do so it's going to start rotating it over four seconds as soon as it started rotating it it's going to wait 5.5 seconds so it's going to take the duration of the spinner which is four seconds and add on 1.5 seconds if we then compiled it it would behave how i suggested earlier but anyway we're just going to see this platform it keeps moving you know ain't nothing stopping this platform this platform is on to higher and better things because it's in an infinite loop you know this platform doesn't want to stop what are we going to do we're going to stand on this beach because we are outsmarting these zombies right now on this magical moving platform you know oh god oh god they're getting to me they can still see me though because we set it up as a moving entity oh god it's got it yeah <laughs> The height of it is slightly too big. If you made it slightly smaller, so sort of the size of a step, then the zombies would be able to climb onto it. And because it is slightly too big, these zombags can't walk onto it. You can see how cool that is. And there's a lot of things you can do with this. Boom, jump onto our platform. So yeah, this is how you might want to set up some things in your map. And it would just keep moving forever because we set it up to move forever. You might want to set this up to triggers so that you can trigger something or some sort of trap or some sort of crazy door system. There's so many different ways that you can use this in your game. The only limitation is to what you can think of. So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. This is it for the GSC scripting lesson two. Let me know if you want to see a lesson three or what you want to see in lesson three. Maybe have it so there's all sorts of stuff moving simultaneously. Maybe script it so that it's on a trigger. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you want to see next and I will get to work. So yeah, other than that, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Take it easy. Stay freezy and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Oh yeah, don't forget to smash the like and subscribe if you haven't already. Take it easy. All right, see ya. I'm Dark and Dead. Bye. Hello? I'm in the middle of a recording. Right, sounds good. Have a great day. Bye. I'm <laughs> sorry.